we thank you that you love us even though we are so temporal and dust like you have created us and when you made us you made us to live forever and you've made us to serve you and to know you and yet millions around the world know little or nothing of you some who are suppressing the truth and you will never give it because they will not respond to what they know but others who are open and hungry, and you will give them the good news. We pray for our role in that this week, that we would be sensitive to those people, that you would bring into our life's path, help us to be ready to speak the word, to make a hope for a defense for the hope that's within us. Give us the opportunity to present the gospel clearly to someone this week. We pray for that, ask you for it. We thank you that we can worship you through a new covenant in spirit and in truth. And we ask, Holy Father, as we open your word, that the spirit who gave every single word in every letter of scripture would help us to understand it. I pray for his unction this morning that he would come upon me and give me the strength that I need. For without him I can do nothing, but with him all things are possible. Together may we lift up the Lord Jesus whom we love. We make our prayer to you, Father, by the Spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. For those of you joining us for the first time, last week we began a brand new series on this book. We'll go through, by God's grace, Jesus doesn't come back first, every single chapter and every single verse. And this book will capture your attention, I promise. It will stir your imagination. And it will point you to the grand and glorious finish that God has for this world. We saw the word revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis. It means an unveiling. And so some of your books have the title over it, the apocalypse. And that's from the first book of the Bible. The titles are not inspired. They are written there by publishers to help you find out where you are in the Bible. But it's rather interesting that a book whose meaning refers to something that is revealed and open. For many, it is a mysterious book. It is a closed book, even some Christians. In fact, most pastors today no longer preach the book of Revelation. And one of the reasons that makes it so mysterious is because of all the Old Testament references and our ignorance to the Old Testament and our ignorance of the promises, the unconditional promises that God made to the Hebrew people. We mentioned last time that there are over 300 references to the Old Testament in the 404 verses in the Revelation. That's about 75% of the book. And so the Old Testament references are never introduced like Isaiah said or Moses said or Hosea said, but they're woven like a beautiful tapestry, and we'll see why all the way through this marvelous, marvelous book. Now, it's confusing to many because they apply one principle of interpretation for the Old Testament, and typically the same for the New Testament, but they apply a different way to interpret the Revelation. But God within the Scriptures gave us the key on how to interpret any passage of Scripture. We see taught by Jesus and the apostles and even different Old Testament prophets interacting with other prophets that we are to interpret the Bible in its plain sense. We take it in its historical, literary context and then apply it. All right, let's pick up where we left off. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. Now, some of you remember the Y2 crisis, that, Y2K crisis that happened right at the turn of the century, and it struck panic across America and even in many Christian homes. 
I remember the bookstores pushing all these books that you needed to buy to be prepared for the Y2K crisis that was coming. Many of the Christian broadcasts, even on our own station, were dedicated to the Y2K problem. In fact, there were Christian companies selling food storage supplies, even one company that was selling windmills. Several people would call on the Bible line and ask me what I thought about the Y2K thing, and I said, I think it's utter sheer nonsense. And I heard from some people, they said I was irresponsible towards God's people. Some Christians moved away from the cities into the countryside, and they appealed to Luke 21, 21. Those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city. The problem with their behavior is Luke chapter 21, and that verse is referring to a coming day that has never been on the earth, the Great Tribulation. It's actually written to Jewish people who are living in Judea, not to Americans living, say, in Chicago. Not only are people curious about the future, and by the way, you should be curious about the future. You should be curious about the return of the Lord from heaven. In fact, if you're not, you ought to be, because God tells us in 2 Timothy 4 there is a special reward for those who love his appearing. But you ought to be curious about the future, because God says if you are and you understand the implications of prophecy, it will change your life today. John wrote these words in 1 John 3, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So wanting him to return is a good thing, but you must guard yourself against the extremes. Peter tells us in his second letter that there will be markers in the last days who will come. And they'll say, where is the promise of his coming? Everything remains the same, just like it has from creation. Peter says, this one fact escapes their notice. God has intervened in time and space before, like he did with the great flood. Even so, he will intervene in time and space again. And they, these mockers just call what we teach this morning, pie-in-the-sky theology. But neither must we close our eyes and refuse to see what God is doing in our world especially as it relates to Israel and even Jerusalem. If you want to know what God is doing on his prophetic clock, look at Israel and more specifically look at Jerusalem. But we as Christians must avoid the false prophets of our day, some who enter into Christendom, some who have set dates, who say they have a word from God. This book itself, the revelation at the end, will warn us about adding or subtracting to the revelation he has given. But the truth is, is that the human heart craves to know the future. That's why today there will be millions and millions of hits across our great country of people who will check their horoscopes because they want to know the future. I heard about a pastor in Honolulu being hustled on the streets of, a, of that city by a fortune teller who said, for a sum of money, I will tell your future. And he said, you mean to tell me that you can tell me for this sum of money exactly what I will be doing at this time tomorrow. She said, I can. He said, I'll tell you what. I will pay you double if you can tell me what I was doing exactly at this time yesterday. <laughs> the good news is that as Christians, we don't need to listen to false prophets. We don't need some new revelation, some new insight about the future. We have the Bible. And though we are not told the complete when, we are given much of the what, the where, the whom, and the why, and the atmosphere, especially as it relates to the second coming. So our God is sovereign in the affairs of men and nations. And verses 4 through 8, which we are going to study this morning, will underscore that. God is a trinity. And we are going to see this morning a greeting from heaven. The triune God is going to greet his people and speak to us. And so we're studying this morning the revelation that the Father gave to the Son and then transmitted by an angel to the Apostle John to us, his bond slaves. And if you are here today and you've not yet been born again, I would love to lead you to the Savior. Jesus said you must be born twice to enter the kingdom of God. But when you are born again, you become one of his bond slaves. But if you're not and you remain an unbeliever, 
this book will be very difficult for you to understand. It's written to his bond slaves, to those who have eyes to see it. Otherwise, you will end up mocking it. Now, let me bring us into the context, because every text has a context. And without understanding the context, you can pretext and then distort the meaning of the Scripture. So let's talk about the big picture for a moment, and then we'll zoom in on the immediate. We saw last time that God, like in Acts, gave us a divine outline for the book of Revelation. It's found in Revelation 119. John is instructed, therefore, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. According to verse 19, this book divides into three sections. Chapter 1 describes the past. Chapters 2 and 3, the present. Chapters 4 through 22, the future. Certainly, you could further subdivide the book, but God has given us a divine outline, and I think for a purpose, because when you stick to it, it creates any artificial interpretations, and it helps us to understand what is actually going on. The things that you've seen, that's the past. He writes of it in chapter 1, that glorified Christ in heaven. The things that are, that's the present, chapters 2 and 3. He writes of seven literal actual churches that are present in his day. And then beginning in chapter 4, all the way through chapter 22, the coming tribulation. He will give us a picture of the throne room of God in chapters 4 and 5, 6 through 18, the coming tribulation, 19, the visible return of Christ from heaven, 20, the great judgment of God and a picture of heaven in 21 and 22. So there's the book in chart form, the things past, the things present, the things future. Chapter 1 deals with the Christ, chapter 2 with the church, chapter 3 with uh, chapters 4 through 22 with the consummation. So we see Christ in his glory, we see Christ in his church, and ultimately Christ in his judgment. Now let's get a running start. That's the big picture, all right? And I hope before we are done that outline will be burned into your psyche that you'll be able to walk yourself through the book of Revelation. And God wants you to do that. Then it becomes a tool in your hand that you can use not just in your own life but in discipling other people. Now, in the immediate context, the verse opens the revelation of Jesus Christ. We noted last time that the word revelation in Greek, as in English, is singular, not plural. This is not the book of Revelations. It is the book of Revelations, singular. Now, there are multiple visions. But there is one unveiling, and it is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It has a unified content, and it self-describes itself not as revelation, but as revelation. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I noted in some old King James Bibles, some will say the revelation of John. Some will say the revelation of John the divine, or John meaning the theologian. Most King James Bibles say the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember, the chapter titles are not inspired. But this is not the revelation of John. It's not the revelation of John the Divine. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is about him. It's not John's revelation. It's Christ's revelation. It's given to Jesus by the Father. Not because he is learning something. He is the omniscient God. He knows today the date and the hour he's returning in his glorified body. But it's given to him in the sense that he is the one who is going to unfold it. He is the one who is going to execute the great events that we see in this book. And he is the one who does the revealing. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him for what purpose? To show. He is going to show his bondservants something about the future. This book was not given to mystify, but to explain God more clearly. To get, to, it was given to him to show his bondservants, his people, those things which must soon take place. Now, the thoughtful reader will say, now, wait a minute. What do you mean by soon? After all, this was written 2,000 years ago, and it appears that very little of it has taken place. Well, seven times in the Revelation, God will use this word soon, or many of your translations render it quickly. It is the word taxis. We get our word tachometer from it. You know, a tachometer, we used to put them up on our steering columns in our car. Now it's standard equipment in a lot of cars. But it, it refers to something quick or sudden. And we will see. His point is, is that once the events of the revelation begin to unfold, they will unfold very quickly. We will see the uh, sealed trumpet and bold judgments unfold in that way suddenly. 
And so let's read the entire verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to Jesus, not to John, but to Jesus, to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it secondarily by his angel to his bond servant John. Now, if you have the NASB, you will note the word communicated has a little footnote. It brings you out into the margin, notice, and you will see that the alternate reading is signified. In fact, that's the way the King James renders it. And maybe that's a better way to translate it. Signified. The first four letters of the word is sign, S-I-G-N. This book was signified. It is given in signs and idioms and pictures. It's the same word that John uses for miracle in his gospel. There are different words in the Bible for miracle. Teros, that describes the wonder and awe a miracle produces. There's the word uh, dunamis, which uh, speaks of the power of a miracle, where God alters the laws of nature. But then there's the word semion that John uses throughout his gospel. And it's for a miracle with a message. John selects seven specific miracles in his gospel to show that Jesus is the Christ and in believing in him you'll have life in his name. He uses that same word here. He's telling us God is giving us signs or symbols that have a message behind them. They're speaking of real events, but God uses symbols, and we will see why before we are done, to communicate this great portion of apocalyptic literature. But these symbols depict real people, real situations, real events. I told you last time, sometimes people will ask the question, do you interpret the Bible symbolically or do you interpret it literally? And the answer is yes. You interpret the symbol and then once you understand what the symbol means, you literally believe it. And so in this chapter, we're going to read of seven golden lampstands. But God will interpret it for us in the chapter itself that those seven lampstands refer to seven literal churches. Or if the Bible describes Satan as a great red dragon, you don't conclude, well, the devil here is described symbolically, therefore there mustn't be a devil. No, he is using a symbol to describe his ferocious and cruel nature. And so you interpret the symbol and then you literally believe it. But here's the point. The Apostle Apostle John wants you to know that this revelation was signified to him. It was communicated to him through symbols. And the key for understanding most of these signs or symbols are right in the book of Revelation itself or the Old Testament. Now, I told you Daniel was critical to understanding the revelation. That's why we spent a year on it, because it unfolds the theological time frame and scheme, the schematic that God will use to pull off these events. But within Revelation, sometimes people say, well, I think this means this. And they give this bizarre and wild interpretation. And if they would just read a few verses later or in the next chapter, the actual symbol is interpreted and they're way off, not even close. But again, it's a mystery to many people because 300 of the 404 verses in the Revelation are Old Testament references where the symbol is explained. And we'll even see a little bit of that today. Furthermore, we read in verse 2, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So the chief characteristic of this book reveals the Messiah, not in his earthly life, but what he saw, (laughs) and we're going to begin to study that over the next two weeks, of the glorified Lord in heaven. We're going to see the Lord Jesus, not in his earthly life, as we see him pictured in the Gospels, with the exception of that one glimpse at the transfiguration, but we're going to see him as the reigning sovereign Lord. Yes, there are parallels between his earthly life, because God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But he's not pictured in the Revelation, as many of you in your own mind still picture him walking through the dusty streets of Jerusalem. Beyond that picture and beyond the lessons we learn of Yeshua in those Gospels, God wants you to see him also in his glorified, reigning, sovereign body. And so then we find in verse 3, if you remember, the first of seven Beatitudes. Seven becomes an important number in this book. The first of seven Beatitudes found in the revelation look at verse 3 blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near revelation is a pretty amazing book and it has a challenge and it says basically read me and if you will read me you will receive a special blessing 
Now, certainly there are general admonitions all the way through the Scripture of the benefits of our reading the Bible. But this is the only book in all of the Word of God that basically says, if you read this book and you hear what it says and you apply it, you're going to be blessed. So there are three things that are underscored. Those who read, those who hear, and those who heed. It's essential they read it in the first century. And God gave the lector, because this was pre-printing press, and unless someone stood up in the church and read the Revelation, people would not hear it. So God gave a blessing for those who would take the time to do that. And certainly you have a greater privilege than any first century saint did. Most of you have a copy of the Bible in your lap. But God wants you to hear it, not just through the auditory canals, but with the heart. And once you read it and hear it, then he wants you to heed it, like James says. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. God has given us the revelation, not just to inform us about the future, but to change our lives. Not to make us smarter sinners, but to make us more like Jesus Christ. And then the last part of the verse, it says, for the time is near. And I noted last time, there are two words for time in the Bible. This is not the word chronos, that we get our word calendar or clock from chronology. It is the word kairos that speaks of seasons. John is saying this season is near. The next great error in God's redemptive plan, because the Bible, we will see, teaches the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We've been in the last days since the day of Pentecost. Jesus could have come at any time since the day of Pentecost. I believe we're now even in the last of the last days, what Daniel calls the latter days. Those are the days at the end of time, right before the second coming. In either case, John recognized that the time was near because he believed it could have happened in his life, and he should have, because that's what the New Testament teaches. And any remaining prophecy that had not been fulfilled would follow in the seven-plus years all the way through the millennium. Now, we live in a day, a few thousand years later, when even in our lifetime, God has been fulfilling prophecy for the second coming. The second coming is a prophecy-driven event. There's all kinds of things that must happen. There's never, ever in the history of the church, since the church was conceived at Pentecost, has there ever been a single prophecy that needs to be fulfilled for the rapture. He could come before this service is end. With that said, as we see this prophecy-driven event, the second coming unfolding, we should be all the more in tune that we were, were that much closer to the rapture. Now, that's the context. Let's now begin to get into the meat of the sermon. Again, you can see this sermon is entitled, A Greeting from Heaven. And there comes a greeting from the Father, Spirit, and Son. First, a greeting from God the Father. Let's pick up in verse 4 where we left off last time. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, I recently received a long typed letter, and there was no return address on the outside, so I went to the last page, number one, because I don't read unsigned letters, or occasionally someone knows that, and they sign it, but I couldn't read their signature if my life depended on it, and I throw those in the basket. I've learned to do that. That was some good counsel I got 30-some years ago. But I usually go to the signature page if there's no return address. Why? Because it adds meaning to the letter. It adds depth, like, who is it that's speaking to me? Well, they were much wiser in the first century because they put it right in the introduction. In the introduction of every letter in the New Testament, you are immediately alerted to who is writing it. And that's helpful. He says in verse 4, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Now, when you see the word Asia in the Revelation, don't think of the continent, the Far East Asia that we have today. Asia, in the New Testament realm, was a province within the Roman Empire. Today, it basically encompasses the country of Turkey. You can see on this map, uh, here is Asia Minor. It's Little Asia, so to speak, uh, as we call it today. And you can see this horseshoe-type shape of seven churches. When we come to chapter 2, we'll start in Ephesus. We'll go to Smyrna, north to Pergamum. Then we'll make our way southeast through Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Seven churches, seven real churches. You say, well, why seven? Why not three? Why not twelve? 
Well, we'll explore that. That's an important question. And why these seven? Why not the church at Rome or the church in Jerusalem or that great missionary church, the church at Antioch? God has a reason for that. But the number seven is not by accident either. Because the number seven is used in the Bible and especially in the revelation of perfection, of completion. Here's just a sample of some of the sevens here in the Revelation. We're going to learn of seven churches, seven spirits mentioned uh, four different times, seven lampstands, seven stars, seven lamps, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven peals of thunder, 7,000 people, seven heads, seven diadems, seven angels, seven plagues, seven bowls, seven mountains, seven kings, seven beatitudes, seven I ams, and that's just a small part of it. Because many times within a verse, you'll see a seven-part structure. And then sometimes even in the Greek New Testament, there'll be a seven-pointed grammatical structure. I mean, it's seven, seven, seven all the way through the book. And we will see. God has a reason for that. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, notice, grace to you and peace. These seven churches are recipients of grace and peace from the Father. Notice how the Father is described, who is, and who was. And who is to come. And that famous ironic blessing. You may not recognize it from number six, but virtually everyone in this room has heard it. You know that God's grace and peace is communicated to his people Israel. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. And if you know Jesus Christ in a saving way, then you know something of his grace and you know something of his peace. And, of course, this is going to be very important to these seven churches because they are being persecuted, and the persecution is going to get much worse. Now, when you read through Revelation, more is said about the wrath of God in the Revelation than any other book. Sometimes in ignorance, people will say, well, I don't believe the God of the Old Testament, but I believe the God of the New Testament. You ever hear that? They've never read the New Testament. especially Revelation. You see more pictures of the wrath of God in this book than in any other book in the Bible. But the Revelation will still show these two words, the grace of God and the peace of God, that epitomizes what God wants his people to know, and even what God wants unbelievers to know, because God will be reaching out to those who have never heard the gospel before during the tribulation to give them a chance to respond. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. So after John identifies himself on the recipients, he gives a description here of God the Father. Remember when Moses met God, uh, God at that burning bush in Exodus 3.14, and he asked God what his name is, and God said, you tell the Hebrew people, I am whom I am. The word I am, Jehovah, or more accurately, scholarly, we'd say Yahweh, describes God's eternal nature. Not I was sends you, not I will be sends you, but I am sends you, the one true eternal God with no beginning or end. Now, we are created, and when God creates us, he makes us immortal. That is, he makes us to live forever. But God alone has immortality. God alone has eternality. You and I have a birthday. God had no beginning or end. There was never a time when God did not exist. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. Now, God tells Moses later on that um, he is also the first and the last, and Isaiah will expand on that title. In fact, not only will these descriptions be given to the Father, but they will be given to God the Son. We're going to come to verse 8 in a moment. And there Jesus will say, I am the Alpha and the Omega says the Lord God. This is Jesus talking, who is and who was and who is to come. And when you come to the end of the Revelation, where Jesus is speaking again, he will say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And that's important, because the same terms that are used to describe God the Father are used to describe God the Son. Revelation will do more to affirm the deity of Christ in the skeptic's mind, than probably any other single book. And Jesus understood the meaning of the term I am, and the Jews did as well, because he said on one occasion, before Abraham was born, I am. See, Jesus told those Jewish people that day, he was not simply a prophet, like the Muslims teach, as Islam affirms, 
nor are they saying that he was created, that God the Father came down and had an intimate relationship with the Virgin Mary, and then came Jesus, as Mormonism teaches. No, he is the great I am the one with no beginning or end, and they understood his claim because they picked up stones to stone him. Why are you stoning me, he said, for the good deeds I do? No, they said, because you are a blasphemer. You, being a man, make yourself out to be God. But what we're going to see is the Son and the Father are described in the same way. Grace to you and peace from him who is and was in his to come. So here in verse 4, these descriptions present God as eternal. He always has been, he always is, and he always will be. But he is also the God of time and space. He is very much present. Now remember, he is right now, and that's going to be important to them. And he's going to show them this, these seven churches, because they are being beaten up. And when you're being persecuted, sometimes your question is to ask, where is the Lord? And remember when, where John is. We'll come to it next time in verse 9. He's on the Isle of Patmos. He's ex- in exile there. He's being persecuted for his own faith. And so John wants them to understand that God is there. Just as Jesus said, a sparrow cannot fall to the ground apart from his notice. God is there. He is watching. In that great psalm, Psalm 58, David records, that God has taken all of our tears and he puts them in a bottle. And then he has a book I call the Book of Tears where he writes about the meaning of those tears. Maybe he'll show it to us someday. It's a vivid portrayal that God knows what is happening in your life, that the trials and the troubles that you may know of today, God is seeing, he is watching. He is the God of grace and he is the God of peace. So there's a greeting from God the Father, but it doesn't stop. We also have a greeting from God the Spirit, a greeting from God the Spirit. Let's read now verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now that's an interesting designation for the Spirit of God. If you're using the New American Standard or the King James or the New King James, you will notice that the word Spirit is capitalized. Because they take this as a reference to the Holy Spirit, and I think correctly so. Now, here's the challenge. We have these ancient manuscripts, some 20,000 that go back to the early days of Christ, and they are unicals. That is, every single word is in capitals. And then in the 9th century on, we have minuscules, which are basically um, manuscripts where you have capitals and lowercase letters. And so there are some places where people debate, well, is this a spirit? And so you will read in some commentaries, these seven spirits are seven angels, but not the Holy Spirit. And I understand why maybe they make that conclusion, because they don't think that there's seven Holy Spirits, but only one. But they miss the point. Now listen, this is a reference to God, the Holy Spirit. The context tells you that. How do you know that? Because throughout the Bible, when God greets us or he gives a benediction, he never combines himself with some human or some angel. For instance, typically in Paul's epistles, he'll start, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. And in many of the benedictions, some that are triunity, there'll be a reference to the Father, Son, and Spirit. God never incorporates himself in some blessing, in some benediction, or in some greeting with a human or even the human writer of Scripture. He separates himself. And so in the immediate context, they have a reference to the Father that no one debates, and a reference to the Son that no one debates, and in the middle, to have these seven angels also greeting you, really goes against the pattern of Scripture. But again, the reason sometimes people are confused on the Revelation, because as I told you, most of the references are from the Old Testament. And this idea of a sevenfold description of the Spirit comes right out of the Old Testament. Put out in the margin there, Isaiah 11 and verse 2. Isaiah 11 and verse 2. And let me read it to you, and you can see on the chart that follows the seven designations of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This, by the way, is a prophecy speaking of the Messiah's life, the Christ's life, and its relationship to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom, 
and he's the spirit of understanding. He is the spirit of counsel, and he is the spirit of strength. He is the spirit of knowledge, and he is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so God describes the perfect, perfect nature of God the Spirit in his relationship to the Messiah in a sevenfold way. Likewise, the prophet Zechariah uses a, very, uses a very similar description to help us to understand the person and work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this from Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah has a vision, and an angel of God asks him this question, What do you see? And I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand. All of gold with its bowl on the top of of it. And it's seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which were on top of it. Also two olive trees by it. One on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side. It's left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me saying, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said, Do you not know what these are? Alas, I said, no, my Lord. So the angel answers him here in Zechariah 4 and verse 6. Listen to it. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The purpose of the vision, if you know the passage, as seen in the seven lamps and these seven spouts and these two olive trees, is to show that the Messiah would have the Holy Spirit's enablement without any restraint. Israel also is told in this passage that she too can know the power of the Holy Spirit. And so God uses this Old Testament imagery to describe the perfect completeness of the Spirit of God in this sevenfold nature. In fact, it's further defined in Zechariah in verse 10 and that the eyes of the Lord which move to and fro through the whole lamps are symbolic of the, through the whole world are symbolic of the seven lamps. But here's the point. Don't miss this. Don't get lost in this theology. What God wants his people to know is that, that we don't believe in seven Holy Spirits, not one, two, three, four, five. There's not seven Holy Spirits. There is one Holy Spirit. But the number seven we're going to see in the Revelation is a number of completeness. And he wants these people to know who are suffering that the Spirit of God from heaven as a member of the triune God is greeting them and telling them that he too is going to be there and he is going to enable them and empower them. And when we come to the seven churches, we're going to see the same reference unfolded and we will see how God applies it to his people. So hold on to that. Not by might, not by power, but he will want them to know, by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So there's this greeting from the Father, there's this greeting from the Spirit. Third, there's a greeting from God the Son. Now, it's kind of a different order. Typically, Father, Son, Spirit in the Bible, when God greets us or gives a benediction. But here, Father, Spirit, Son. Why? Because as we're going to see in the Revelation, this book is about Jesus. He is the hero, and actually most of what is all in chapter 1 is all about the Lord Jesus. And so he puts great emphasis on the second person of the Trinity here in this unveiling. Now notice first how he is described in verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Some of your translations say the faithful preacher. Or you could render it the faithful prophet. John will identify in the Revelation the three offices that the Old Testament tells us that the Christ or the Messiah will fill. When Messiah comes, the prophets wrote, he will be prophet, priest, and king. And so, one, he is a faithful witness. He is a prophet. He is a speaker. He speaks truth. Uh, And by the way, remember in the Acts of the Apostles, in Acts 3, when Peter gives his second sermon, he quotes this book, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18 and verse 15. Listen to this. Moses wrote, the Lord your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me. There's going to be similarities between Moses and the Messiah. From among you, from your countrymen, you shall listen to him. And so remember, in the Gospels, they say, are you the prophet or should we expect someone else to come? Not a prophet, but the prophet. When Peter stands up in Acts 3, he quotes Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15, and he applies it to the Lord Jesus. In Acts 7, in that 
fantastic sermon of the entire Old Testament. And if you're new to the faith and you don't know your Bible very well and you want to get a handle on the Old Testament, just study Acts 7 because it will give you an overview of the entire Old Testament. And right before they stone Stephen to death, he gives this fantastic sermon and he says in Acts 7, 37, this is the, this is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brethren. And so they recognize this. Who else should we go to, Peter will say? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus Christ is that prophet. He is the Lord of history. The spirit of prophecy, John will write, is all about Jesus. He didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill it. He is the Lord of prophecy. He is the faithful witness. And there is coming a day when, like all the other prophets who they stoned or killed, Israel will listen to him. That's what Moses said. Hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen in a wholesale way. Notice the second description of Jesus in verse 5. He is the firstborn of the dead. This simply means that he is the very first to come out of the grave in a resurrection body. Now, the word firstborn is a word in the New Testament that speaks of supremacy. And Jesus shows his supremacy over the grave. Now, this is confusing to some. Because they say, well, there's other people who are raised from the dead. Well, actually eight to be specific in the Bible. Here's a chart of them. Remember Elijah raised the widow of Zarephath's son. Then his predecessor, Elisha, raised the Shunammite woman's son. And then if you remember, there was a man who is thrown into Elisha's grave. And as soon as he touches Elisha's bones, he comes back to life. He's raised from the dead. Jesus, if you remember, raised the uh, widow of Nain's son. Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, most famously. Most of us know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Peter raised a woman by the name of Tabitha, also nicknamed Dorcas from the dead. And Paul raised Eutychus from the dead. Eight resurrections in the Bible. But all eight of these eventually got old or sick again. The Bible doesn't tell us, and they're buried in some grave over there in Israel. But Jesus, to use Paul's words, was the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is the firstborn of the dead. Because all those people were raised to life, Jesus was resurrected to life. He was the first one ever to come out of the grave in a resurrected body. And John is going to want you to see him in his resurrection body here in the first chapter. And by the time you are done, you will have, if you don't already, a different perspective of Jesus. John laid his head on the breast of the Lord Jesus there in the upper room for the Last Supper. He was the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. His uh, half-cousin, so to speak, we know from the Scriptures, probably grew up with him. They were either playmates or he was like an uncle to him, and they had a close relationship. But John will fall down like a dead man. When he sees Jesus in his glorified body. Notice also in verse 5. He is further described as the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now the world and its rulers do not recognize that Yeshua is the ruler of the kings of the earth. But he is. They do not recognize Jesus as king. But that is our confession as Christians. That he is king. And that's how Messiah is described in the Bible. Think about it. In Psalm 24 he's called the king of glory. In Daniel 4, we studied it. Christ is called the King of Heaven. At His birth in Matthew 2, where is He who is born King of the Jews? In John 1, He is called the King of Israel. In 1 Timothy 1, He is called the King of the Ages. In Revelation, the 15th chapter, He is called the King of the Saints. In Revelation 19 and verse 16, He is called the King of Kings. Now, when you look around, it doesn't appear that Jesus is reigning. But the Bible teaches he will reign sovereignly while he is in control in heaven. He is coming again and he will literally reign upon the earth. And these dear Christian brothers who say that the church has replaced Israel, that we're the new Israel, that Jesus is not actually going to come to the Mount of Olives and put his feet on it and rule and reign here for a thousand years, spiritualize the scripture. Do you remember what the angel Gabriel told Mary at the birth of Jesus when she finds out she is pregnant by the Spirit and he will be great 
and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That never happens yet, but it's going to happen. And we believe it by faith, not because we feel it, but because God says it. But the Bible is clear that even now, behind the great movements of history, there is one who is ruling and there is reigning. John, Revelation chapter 6, John writes these words. There's coming a day when the peoples of this world will recognize it. Listen to what is going to happen during that seven-year period. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They recognize that what is happening is happening by the hand of Jesus. Revelation 11:15 says, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And so the king of kings, the ruler of the kings of this earth, is going to come again. He is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn of the dead. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And John's going to unfold this for us. This is just the introduction. But he's also our Savior. Look further into verse 5. To him who loves us, and released us from, uh, from our sins by his blood. Now, some of your translations put it to him who loved us, past tense, and released us, past tense. But that's not in a single Greek manuscript. And the reason some translations do that is because it is improper English to mix a present tense with a past tense. And if you had real English... Uh, and I only had one real English teacher in school. Her name was Mrs. Ryan. We called her Rat Ryan. I shouldn't say that, but that's what we called her. She was 91 years old. There was no mandatory retirement, and I'm glad she was still moving. And she taught me at least a little English. It helped me when I got to the seminary. But she would put red ink all over your paper if you mix a past with a present or a future with a past or whatever. No, you don't do that in proper English. And so some, following rules of grammar... Put two past tenses. But as in the New American Standard here, it's so precise. The first word is present. Notice he loves us. And the second word is he released us. Now that's important. Very often when we think of the love of God, we think of it in the past. For God so loved the world. Or Paul will say that he loved us and gave himself for us. And that's important to recognize, but it is equally important to recognize that God is actively loving you. That whatever circumstances you are going through today, whatever people may have done to you and even abused you, God is actively loving you. You say, I don't feel that. Look, I don't see visibly with my eyes that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. But by faith, because God says it, I believe it. And because by faith, God says he is actively loving me, I believe it. Because faith is not a feeling. It is built on the word of God. So understand that. And even if you can't fully conceive that, just look at this past love. That God demonstrated his love for you and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not to mention, if you have been saved, the love of the Holy Spirit has been poured out into your heart. But the verb is at present tense because God is describing the fact that he is constantly, continually, forever loving you. And that's important for these Christians especially to know because they are under persecution and God wants them to know I'm very much in tune to what is happening in your life. To him who loves us, notice, and released us, past tense, do you see that? From our sins, how? By his blood. We are redeemed with the blood of the Lamb. Why? Because the penalty of sin is death. The life is in the blood. You lose enough blood, you're a dead cookie. If God's judgment says our sin deserves death and the life is in the blood, therefore without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. 
And so God released us. There is a debt that you had before God, and God released you from the debt, from every sin you've ever committed or might even commit. He's released you from it. With a shout of victory on the cross, he said, to tell us, die, it is finished. And when we come to Revelation 5 and verse 9, all of heaven will be praising God for the precious blood of Jesus. I hope you've met God through his blood because that is the only way you can be saved is by his blood not by your human effort not by your works because your works can never meet the penalty death but only the blood of jesus can cleanse you and meet the penalty for sin he breaks the power of canceled sin we sing that he sets the prisoner free his blood can make the foulest clean his blood availed for me Have you been able to say, I've come to Jesus for his cleansing power, washed in the blood of the Lamb? If you can't, you need to, because there's no way you will be able to face the Lamb of God in love. Otherwise, you will meet him as your judge. And he made us, referring to these true believers, the bond slaves already mentioned, he made us to be, notice, the next designation, a kingdom priest to his God and Father. The Lord Jesus washed us with his blood, but he didn't stop there. The Bible said he made us a kingdom to be priests of our God. Now, that's unusual. It's unusual to have a kingdom of priests. Usually in any secular kingdom, there are just a handful of people who are priests. The whole kingdom are not priests. And in the only true Old Testament priesthood, namely in Israel, there was only men who could be priests. They could only come from one tribe, and they could only come from one family in that tribe. And those priests who were involved in the sacrificial system could only go into the presence of God once a year, and then only for a very short time. So nearness to God, as we've studied on Wednesday nights, in the Old Testament economy was very, very limited. But God wants you to understand that he has made us a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a kingdom made up of priests. Now, I grew up in a church where there were just certain men that were, in essence, priests. But one of the emphases of the Protestant Reformation is that we are a kingdom of priests. The priesthood of the believer that all of us do not have to go through some man, but we can go directly to God, directly to our great high priest, that we have access to the throne of God as believer priests. And so once a week, sometimes once a month, I would go into that little confessional, and the guy would open the door, and I'd say, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been three weeks since my last confession, and here are my sins. And I was told that he alone could absolve me of my sin. But the great blessing of the New Testament is that we are believer priests. That you don't need a pastor or a priest or anybody else. That if you have been saved, God has made you a member of a royal priesthood. And everyone in his kingdom is a part of that. And you can go directly to God. I heard about a man who was Baptist talking to his Catholic friend. He said, I want to ask you a question. I'm trying to understand your Catholic faith. He said, let me ask you a question. When when, when you sin, who do you confess your sin to? He said, well, I I confess my sin to my priest. He said, okay. And I thought about it for a while and satisfied him. And he said, well, let me ask you another question. He said, when your priest sins, I mean, he does sin, right? When, when, When your priest sins, who does he confess his sin to? Well, the Catholic responded, yes, he sins too, and he confesses his sin to his bishop. He said, okay, that satisfied him for a while. He thought about it. He said, well, wait a minute. minute." When the bishop sins, who does he confess his sin to? He said, well, he he confesses his sin to the archbishop. Well, that satisfied the man for a while. He said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know the archbishop is getting up there, but I assume he sins too. Who does he confess his sin to? The Catholic man thought for a while. He said, well, he confesses his sin to the cardinal. That satisfied him, and he thought about it. He said, no, no, wait a minute. Does the cardinal ever sin? Surely he must sin too. So who does he confess his sin to? He said, well, that's easy. The, The cardinal confesses his sin to the Pope. He said, no, I mean no disrespect. 
And I know you call him the Holy Father. But surely the Pope must sin. Who does the Pope confess his sin to? He said, well, um, I guess he goes directly to God. He said, you mean to tell me the Pope is a Baptist? (laughs) Now, my friend, you can confess your sin this morning directly to God Almighty. We can directly go to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus. He has made you a kingdom of priests. He's released us from our sins by his precious blood. And to him, John just breaks out in praise, be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By the way, this doxology linguistically, grammatically goes back to Yeshua, Jesus. We are only to praise and worship God. But here is John praising and worshiping Jesus because he indeed is worthy of glory and dominion and praise forever and ever and ever. He's just so overwhelmed. He can't but break out in praise. And sometimes when you ponder the goodness of God, you can only do the same. And remember, this would be a huge comfort to these persecuted saints and to John, who's on the Isle of Patmos. He, in essence, is implying, listen, I've just heard from the heavenly emperor. I've just told you about Father, Spirit, and Son. I've heard from our heavenly emperor in Domitian. You're not it. You are a ruler, you are a temporal ruler, but you are not the ultimate ruler. And he wants them to realize that someday the kings of this world will understand that. Now these are not theory, this is truth. It's speaking of him who loved us. And so we read now in verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it, so it is to be. Amen. Now remember, this is wrought with Old Testament. And so he uses two Old Testament passages. You might want to jot them down. We studied one of them, Daniel 7:13, where Daniel has these night visions where Jesus comes back on the clouds. And Zechariah 12, verses 10 through 14, a prophecy of the second coming of the Messiah. And so John is reminding them, and he starts this verse with, Behold, when he says that, he's saying, listen, pay attention. I I was reading one of my older books in my library this week from the 1800s, and occasionally out in the margin, the author would have this hand printed out in the margin. If you've ever seen an old book, you you see this hand out in the margin. And that was the way they said in the 19th century, what I'm going to say on this page, this is probably the most important thing. So pay very, very close attention. So when John says, behold, he's saying, pay attention to what I am about to say. He is coming with the clouds. Not he will be. Please note, he is coming. He uses a future present, a prophetic present. If you were with us in our series on Romans, we studied the prophetic past tense in Greek. And in that great unbroken chain of God's love for us, it talked about how he predestined us past tense. He called us past tense. He justified us past tense. He glorified us past tense. Wait a minute. I'm not in my glorified body. But he uses a prophetic past because he wants them to know that everyone who's been predestined, called and justified, will be glorified, that our salvation is so secure that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Here he uses a future present. He's saying this is so certain. He is on the way. He is coming. And it is so certain. I'm using a present tense to describe like he's already on the way. And when it happens, notice, every eye will see him even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. This is referring to the prophet Zechariah, to the crucifixion, to the one who is going to be pierced through. And the Bible teaches, as we will learn in the Revelation, that the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, are going to believe on Yeshua as the Messiah during the seven-year tribulation. They are going to realize that the one they pierced through was their Messiah, that they crucified the promised one, 
such that when they see him, that's not when they are converted. That would be inconsistent with the way God works, like giving some people a benefit that he doesn't. They're converted during the tribulation period. But when they see him whom they have pierced, the Bible says they will mourn. Let me read it to you. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of a firstborn. They will mourn as one mourns for his only son. And the Hebrew word here for mourn is a word that is used exclusively of someone who mourns over someone they love. And when you lose someone whom you deeply love, you mourn. But in this case, they are not mourning for themselves. They are mourning for Yeshua, for the one whom they pierced. And it's a reference to what the Jews are going to do. But in this verse, in the Revelation, John applies it not just to them, but all the tribes of the earth. Why? Because during the tribulation, people from every trunk, tongue and tribe and nation, people who have never before heard the gospel in power and clarity, for those will be the only ones who will have a chance, not people like yourself who have heard the gospel before the rapture, but those who have never heard it, and they are going to see him too, and they will mourn. And I'm sure when we see our Savior at the rapture, and we see his nail-scarred hands, we say it, sing it, rich wounds yet visible above, even in his glorified body, that we too will mourn like one would mourn for his only precious beloved son. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Now don't miss this. The promise of the second coming is vital for the believer. He is coming with the clouds. Where does he get that? He got it from the book of Daniel. Daniel 7:13. There he has a vision of the Messiah. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven... One like a son of man was coming. In Acts 1 and verse 9, on the mind of all of the ascension. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. In Acts 1, 11, the angels of God say, Men of Galilee, why, are you why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the exact same way on a cloud as you have watched him go into heaven. And Jesus states the same thing in Matthew 26, quoting the prophet Daniel. I tell you that hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now clouds throughout the Old Testament, if you know your Old Testament, are associated with God the Father, with Yahweh, with His deity, with His greatness. But here in the Revelation, God will associate those clouds with His Son because to see Jesus is to see the Father. And the Bible here says, every eye will see Him. This is a reference to the second coming. At the rapture, we meet the Lord in the air. But when He comes again, and I suppose God will use the technologies of the world, the Internet, your smartphone, television cameras, for every single eye on the planet to be able to see Him. Or maybe He'll just show Himself magnificently across the skies. I don't know how He will do it, but every eye, every person will see it. And John says, so be it. Amen. Amen means agreed. Yes, it's going to happen. Amen to that, He says. He's saying this is not a guess. This is not some fabricated thought. This is the blessed hope. This is the promise of God for his people. And then he says, hearing the voice of the Son again, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, you will see this is in red letters. Now, understand this is important. Because in verse 17, Jesus will say, I am the first and then the last. And in Revelation 22 and verse 13, he will say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, same 
description here in verse 8. The first and the last, same description in verse 1 and verse 17, the beginning and the end. Why is this important? Because God describes himself, we've already seen in this greeting, the Father says, I am the one who is and who was and who is to come. But now Jesus is referred to as the Lord God and as the Almighty. Because Jesus is no ordinary man. He is the God-man, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is indeed Lord. And when he comes, your heart will be broken because you will recognize it is not simply the Jews that pierced him through on that cross. It was not simply the Romans who put the nails physically on that cross. The Bible says he was pierced through for our iniquity. It was our hard hearts that were the hammers. It was our nails. It was our sins that were the nails. And we will mourn like one mourns for their only son. But we will praise the Lord and be so glad he has come as our redeemer. Now this is glorious news for the believer. But there's a different kind of mourning that will come upon the unbeliever. Because when they see him... They will recognize he's not coming as their savior. He is coming as their judge. And they will mourn with weeping and gnashing of teeth for all of eternity. That's not God's design for your life. You can laugh at this. You can mock at it. But just as every single prophecy came true for the first coming of Jesus, every single prophecy. Prophecy will happen for a second, and we will be wise, wise to call upon him in faith. Now, our Father, we thank you that for me to live is Christ, but to die is a great gain, and someday we will realize that gain. But in the interim, you have called us, even this week, to care about people, about where they are going to spend eternity. We can't care about everyone, and so with Paul, we pray for an open door of opportunity to share the gospel. I pray today for someone who's listening to me, wherever they may be, someone who's unsure that heaven is their home and your word teaches they're unsure because they've not put their faith where you put their sin on the cross. That you redeemed us with your blood, Lord Jesus. Help them to see that your cry of victory, it is finished, it's paid in full, is true. That they cannot add to it. That if they will come and believe what you've promised, that because you did what you did, whoever will call upon your name, you said, will be saved. Help some dear soul, some man, some woman, some boy, some girl, to say, Jesus, save me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you receive sinful people, that you came into the world to save sinners. Now help us as those who've been bought with a great price to live for you in every respect, May we grow in grace as we study this revelation that you've given to us and love you more fully because of it. And we ask it in your holy name. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation as we close our service. And if you're here and you've received Jesus, maybe even today and you've never made it public, that's a first step. The Bible says if your salvation is real, you won't be ashamed of him. If you've never been baptized, that's the symbol of our confession as we've seen these today being baptized. And if you're here and you need a church home, the Bible teaches every Christian needs a church home. Some don't want to commit. They want to live in disobedience. That's their choice. But if you need a church home, if not this church, go to another one. But, but don't, don't do what the Bible tells you not to do. Make a commitment to a local fellowship that you might serve God's people. So there's the invitation. If you have a need to express Leave your seat and come to this front row.